So welcome to Ask the Coach part three. Today I'm joined by Lynn Paxman from Evolve You. Welcome Lynn and thank you ever so much for joining us today. If you could just tell us a little bit about yourself and what it is that you do, that would be great. Yeah, thanks ever so much for having me Lorraine. I really appreciate uh, this, this chance and it's just really nice to connect with new people, isn't it? And people that you already know in a different way, I think. But um, this time's given us an opportunity to do that really, isn't it, over Zoom? Um, so yeah, I've been in learning and development for sort of over 20 years and um, I started sort of way back working in um, service, hospitality, retail type of businesses. And then a few years ago, I worked for a consultancy up in Cheshire and um, it was sort of one of those jobs that's a lot of people's dream jobs. And I didn't realise it at the time, but sometimes these opportunities come along, don't they? And you don't appreciate them until afterwards. And uh, it was a fabulous place. We had a high ropes course and um, we did archery and we worked with horses and we did so many amazing activities. And it was all about leadership development and team development. And I was there for five years, just an amazing experience. And it came for me at a time in my life when I kind of needed it. So um, a couple of years before I'd separated from my ex-husband, I've got two really young children. It was a big, um, a big leap for me to, to take the job because the guy who set the center up, he was, um, he was a one man band and he was investing in the overheads. And somebody said to me, why are you leaving a really secure job to go and work with someone who's, you know, a startup essentially. And I was, I was leaving focused DIY at the time. Um, but I just decided, yeah, I am a bit scared, but if I wasn't scared, what would I do? I would definitely take this job. And that's what I did. And it was the best experience I could have had for myself and for my career, I suppose, because I was surrounded by people who just naturally coached, people who naturally asked questions and listened and helped you to reflect. And it was what I needed at a time when actually I was, I was struggling personally, you know, I felt hurt and um, it was a really difficult time and it was part of my recovery really. And at the same time, I was given the opportunity to work with loads of different organisations like BQ, Bupa, Quick Fit, Fu Jitsu, Councils Housing Associations, you know, so many different organisations and their leadership teams and teams that were going through change. And I learned so much about putting theory into practice and how to help it make sense for people, I think. And I always love learning and I love I just absorb theories and books about psychology and things like that, but it's then how you make sense of it for other people, I suppose. And that place really helped me to do that. Um, and one of the businesses that came to, uh, they, they came and had a team event with us, was a company called Integrated Dental Holdings. They're now called My Dentist. They're the country's largest dental corporate. And um, one of the guys who came on that, um, that event, I was doing a high ropes course and I used to have to tie the harnesses on. I was tying the harness on him. You have to get quite close and personal when you tie the harness on. And I thought, oh, I quite fancy him, but he's probably got no emotional intelligence. Um, I'm now married to him. Um, <laughs> it wasn't true. He had loads of emotional intelligence. And we started to see each other. And then, then I said, I'm not leaving my job because I really love what I do here. There's no way I'm leaving my job. He lived in Somerset and I was up there. But I did. A year later, I moved to Somerset and I'm really pleased that I did. And I actually ended up working for my dentist for a number of years. Accidentally, almost, um, it started part time temporary and I was um, engaging with dental practice owners, asking them if they'd like to sell their dental practice. And I guess my coaching experience helped me to do it quite well, because rather than selling to them or it being about a transaction, I was coaching them to help them to make a decision about what they wanted to do with their lives in the future and whether selling their dental practice was part of that future vision for them. Um, so I ended up staying with my dentist for four years and created a team from scratch that built a really big pipeline for my dentist and helped them to grow from around 250 practices to over 600 practices in just a few years, which was a really big achievement. <laughs> um, and then I went on to work for a dental company startup called Dentex and helped them to do the same. They grew really rapidly. Uh, within two years, they got to 70 practices, which is quite quick from a complete standing start. 
Um, and then I've done a little bit of work recently with another dental group. So I'm tending to sort of work with dental groups quite a lot, but alongside of that, I've always done work with small to medium organisations and I particularly enjoy working with charities because they're sort of quite purpose-led, vision-led organisations and I just really love tapping into that. So I guess the thing I like to do most of all is match the inside of an organisation to the outside. So what they say out there <laughs> needs to happen in here and in here. And I help them to match that. And that's about leadership and engaging with vision and engaging with values. And it's amazing how often they're mismatched. Yeah, absolutely. And what a, what a fantastic way of kind of bringing to life kind of your experience of, you know, where you were to where you are today. And actually, guys that are in the room um, are going to probably really appreciate hearing that because that really shares a, your journey and actually how mm. you've overcome some challenges uh, in your own life. Um, so thank you for that. So let's open up to the room. Um, would you have any questions um, right away? Anyone in the room fall in? If you do, just pop your hand up and I can um, and unmute and then we'll do it in an orderly fashion. <laughs> We've all gone shy. We are actually live on Facebook as well. So John, fire away. Hello uh, John. Hi, Lynn. Very interesting. Thank you. Um, you talk about the diff the inside and the outside and so on. There, I, there's a wonderful presentation that was done on branding, brands and branding by a guy called Robert Bean at uh, Like Minds way back about 2012. It's on, on YouTube. I don't know if you're aware of it, but he, he is very strong on that. Do, do you see a relationship with branding? You, you actually sent me the link to that video, yeah. John. Oh, right, okay. There Thank you. you. And I've watched it, and absolutely, it, it really makes sense, and it made a lot of pennies drop for me, I think, in terms of what I do. And I often go, I think what happens is organisations kind of focus on the customer outside, don't they? What do we want to say about ourselves to the customer outside? But they don't necessarily do work on how do we articulate who we are and how we want to behave together. And that guy explained that really well. Um, I can't remember the phrase he used, but it was something about sort of sharing a little bit of himself with a colleague that made the penny drop with him, wasn't it? It was how they communicated. Yeah, he was. Uh, he, he's been involved with some huge brands. Yeah, over it was BT, wasn't it? It was BT, yeah. and yeah. they came up with the um, "It's good to talk." But before <laughs> that, it was based on. Ex, um, a reciprocated confidences, which was the fundamentals of that, but it was too yes. complicated to use that term. Yes, yes. But then he That's also it. used at the end that description of what he called the single organising principle yes. um, for an organisation. Yeah, yeah, but it's all joined up, isn't it? But yeah, that reciprocating confidences, that was it, because it, it doesn't stick in your mind, does it, that? Because it doesn't particularly uh, follow off the top. But yeah, that made a lot of sense, and I think that's often my starting point with teams, is to help to facilitate conversations which you know open up that reciprocated confidence so that there's a bit of honesty going on about you know what, what do we really do versus what we say we do and I think in this day and age of the internet and social media i mean i think i don't know if he used this term but there's the same you know that walls have become windows you know yeah yeah absolutely there's a you mean do you mean there's a sort of a lot more transparency as to people how people think in, and uh, yeah absolutely. yeah and and the um customers can see in as well yeah absolutely so if it doesn't match and yeah business leaders spend a lot of time sort of thinking about you know what they're going to do and processes and the efficiencies and things but actually it's the people that that make those flow and i know you and i had a very small debate didn't we about culture and strategy and how you know which one's most important and actually having watched that video i don't know whether you can say one's more important than the other they have to be hand in hand don't they mm, yeah. don't whether you'd agree with me now we need to debate that another time <laughs> that, you know, the, the saying the very interesting saying you know culture eats strategy for breakfast is a way of saying you know that culture is far more important but my response is yeah but if it doesn't have anything to eat it gets very hungry so you know unless Unless there's uh, an implementation of the culture, then it, it withers and dies. Yeah, and I think what's often lacking is a strategy around how to evolve the culture. Yeah, so that's the strategies. True. That, that sounds yeah. a bit more meta to me, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah that's really. <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask John what, what do you mean by meta? 
Oh, it's sort of abstract. It's an extra layer. Oh, I see. Of okay. Yeah. 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 Lynn, Lynn, would you say that's kind of like that facade sometimes where people aren't really being the real, authentic, genuine person? They're just putting up a front in order to to be the brand potentially. Yeah, I think there's lots of layers to it, isn't it? So there's the sort of business brand versus what happens with the, pe the people in numbers, you know, the teams. And then there's also the sort of, yeah, I think a lot of us wear masks and the culture can um, sort of encourage those masks at times. And I think we've been in a, a culture recently of performance culture. You know, we're, we're encouraged to perform to certain objectives and deliver results and that sort of thing. And that's how we get recognised and we're encouraged to perform in a certain way. And actually that the, the performers amongst us, and I've been one of those, learn how to adapt to be recognised and to get promoted. But we stop being who we actually are. We, we don't know who we are anymore. Yeah. And I see, yeah. 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 I see that a lot. Yeah, I see that a lot in all in our society. You kind of hear the word conditioned. You know, you've almost been conditioned yeah. to either society or education or the job or your boss yeah. or, yeah. Absolutely. And it, it concerns me about how personal brand is a big, very big thing these days, isn't it? And we hear, hear a lot about people in the limelight struggling with mental health issues. And I think it's because they start to feel a big disconnect between their personal brand and who they actually are. And they don't know who they are anymore. They don't know who to be. Um, yeah. And... and the impacts of social media and the yes. celebrities and, and all that kind of thing that can have on especially young young people as well but no yes. good 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 questions to start off with there john thank you for that contribution uh who else in the room has a question for lynn andy hello lynn hi andy do you, do you reckon uh, um your business background or your commercial or corporate, whichever background you call it, shapes you as a, as a person and the way you deliver brand mm. advice and, and coaching and things like that? Yeah, do you, do you know what? It's funny, isn't it? Because I think this has been my journey to authenticity, really. Because years ago, I was in a sales role and I went on a selling workshop and the trainer said to, got everybody to think about their personal values and we had to whittle it down to one final value. Everyone in that room came up with recognition, money, performance, that sort of thing. And I came up with tranquility and the sales trainer looked at me and he, he didn't know what to say. He's like, who the hell said, I'm sure this is what he's saying in his head. Who the hell says tranquility on a sales training course? It just doesn't fit. <laughs> so I feel like I've always had a fuss in the commercial world and in the softer world. And I'm a bridger of that gap. And I think that's how I can work with both charities and commercial organisations and sort of adapt to each... I think I can bring the flavour of being a little bit more focused in commercial to the, the charitable sector and actually being a little bit more how and who and being focused mm. to, you know, the commercial organisations that are always on this route, deliver, deliver, deliver. And it's bridging that gap between the two. And it's, it's quite nice when you kind of find your place, isn't it? I'm still getting there, but I feel like I'm finding my place in the world. <laughs> I think I think it's a good thing around values as well because interestingly I think there are some people that wouldn't even know what their values are and yeah. you know that actually our values can change and do change over timelines um, and mm -hmm. where we are in our current life situation but you know so question out to everyone here really is what is your values right now um, you know do you do you know what they are what you what's really important to you right now as a person so the amount of people that tend to kind of feel that the values should be about everyone around them, but actually what's important yeah. to you is, is really key. So another that's a great a, question. Yeah, that's a really good point, Lorraine. It's, it's what's important to you. And we do tend to think that it's about others and actually, yeah, starting from that, you know, it's funneling down, isn't it? To that place of your core, what's important to you. And where on earth yeah. tranquility came from when I was 25, I've no idea, but there you go. That's a pretty good one, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> okay any any other questions from you guys in the room john the other john <laughs> i think we can't hear you john oh hang on can you unmute yourself 
I can't unmute you. You'll need to. There we go. Done it. Uh, now, on that last point about culture and personal brands, etc., or personal, what is your personal beliefs? Um, that business of matching your employees' personal beliefs with corporate culture, which will then come back to are you employing the right people or are you working for the right company? Because if you're yeah. not, then leave. Yeah, it's a really good point, actually, John. I've got not a really a question, actually, is it? Sorry. No, but it leads to me to, to, to something to reply, actually. I've, I've got a really book, good book. I think it's, like, it's too far away from here. It's called The Culture Deck. And it's an examples of organisations that have put together slides which explain what's important to them about what it's like to work for them and um, you know who they are as an employer, that sort of thing. And a couple of them make their organisation sound a bit scary. You know, they sort of like you, you know we play, we work really hard, we play hard, but we expect you to work really hard as well. And you know, no slackers around here. It's that sort of message. And you can read that and think, ah. Oh, I don't think I'll fit in or oh, I'm really up for that, but because they're clear and honest about who they are. And I think that's where sometimes there's a bit of a mismatch as well. We get given a bit of a, a line, don't we, about, oh, it's lovely working here. We're all really collaborative. We get on and blah, blah, blah. And then you, when you get in, everybody's backstabbing. It's, you know, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's not the culture that I was sold. Um, no, do your due so, diligence. Check them out. <laughs> well, that's a very good point, John. Very good point. But there's a lot of spin, isn't there, on these things, yeah. I think. And that's, that's what I find very frustrating. Um, I worked with a charity the other week, oh, the other week, months ago now. Um, and they worked with youth. They were a cafe and they worked with um, they had a youth worker and they had young people who were coming and using the cafe. So it's about helping to support them. It's in Scunthorpe, a deprived area, and they have music events on and stuff. And we were trying to get to their values and they were coming up with stuff that people always say. And then I said, So, what, what are your, um, you know, your catchphrases that you say? And it was things like, Excuse my language, it's not too rude, but excuse my language don't be a dick and shit happens around here or weird, weird shit happens around here and things like that. And they started to sparkle when they were talking about that. And that's who they are. And that's what they want to and need to convey to the outside world. But we're too frightened to say things like weird shit happens around here. Either you'll like us or you won't. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> Matching the more, inside to the outside. <laughs> there's more bu books now that say lots of those words, so I think it probably exactly. is more, more appropriate these yeah. days. <laughs> Thank you for letting me. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> say, Lynn, I worked in Scunthorpe for 25 years, yes. and there's a lot of weird. A lot of weird, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not a difficult place to live, I think. Mm. It's, a, it's a lovely place with with loads of challenges really yeah. good yeah i think i think back to the alignment of values as well if if your values are aligned to the company then the magic happens do you know yeah. what i mean it's where you yeah. where you get your best you out so you know i would if i was coaching somebody i would make sure that there is that alignment um and if there's not then to find find where it is aligned uh, anyone else got a question oh yvonne Oh, I, was just, I was just going to make a point really which is that actually I quite often come across people particularly with my NHS work where people's values when they joined were very much aligned to the organisation but then so much happens within the organisation that actually they suddenly find themselves where their beliefs no longer match and that can be quite hard for people so I think that's quite a common thing that us as coaches come across um, and, um, and then they've got to decide whether that's okay for them or whether they need to actually find it to find mm. somewhere else um yes. so, it, so it isn't just about finding that that good match to begin with actually organizations evolve as much as mm. us as people and sometimes you know you do go in different directions that is a very good point actually Yvonne and that's I think often where us coaches get involved isn't it where the team is sort of just not gelling they're not engaged because there's been a change and, and the organization needs to engage them with that change and it's because they sort of say well hang on a minute this is what we're attached to where we were this is what we believed in and we we don't want to leave it behind john's got uh, john <laughs> no, i have experience of that i worked for several quite a few years for an excellent it training company i mean they were superb 
but then the guys who'd started it decided it was time to sell it and they sold it to the wrong people and they admit now that they did. Uh, it went downhill very fast and uh, a lot of people fell out with it. It was very difficult. And even now, some of the people I know won't, can't bring themselves to call it by its proper name because the name means what it used to be, not what it is now. Yeah. Yeah, it think, happens a lot when ownership changes and CEOs change. I've had that experience as well. Yeah. Yeah, so anyway. no, definitely. It's a really good point to raise. Okay, anyone else uh, have a question in the room? And uh, just quickly out to the guys on Facebook that are watching right now, if there's any questions that you do have for Lynn, she will be here for the next 20 minutes or so uh, to answer any questions. Um, and Lynn sort of specializes very much in sort of the team um, leadership and team sort of development and dynamics. Um, so yeah, anybody else in the room got a question or I will start with some fire questions. That's <laughs> <laughs> scary. <laughs> uh, Linus. Yeah. Uh, Hi Linus. It's pronounced, hello. It's pronounced Linus. Uh, no, Linus. 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 Okay. <laughs> No, no worries. It's, it's a common mistake. I just wanted to ask, uh, Lin, as a as a someone who specializes in leadership, uh, and, and training and developing a team, and as a coach, is there any common pitfalls you see when you're trying to develop a team or you're trying to develop someone professionally? The pitfalls in leadership. I, I think the pitfalls in leadership are what we've talked about. Really, it's that. People often get promoted to, into leadership positions because they're really good at what they do. They're really good at delivering um, you know, outputs, getting results. They know their task really well. They know their process really well. They're really focused on that. But then to be a leader, it, it sort of takes another skill set, another focus. And actually, it's quite challenging personally, having managed people myself. Um, you can often have all the right intentions, but you don't get the results that you want from those people. And you start to question what I did anyway, was start to question myself and think, is it me? Um, am I not good enough at what I'm doing? Um, and it, it sort of brings up all of your, your negative beliefs, you know, your limiting beliefs. So I think that's why it's quite helpful and healthy for people in leadership positions to have some support. And I'd say, especially, leaders of uh, small to medium sized businesses who haven't got anyone else there often in bigger organizations you've got the people you can go to um but those founders or ceos don't have that person and you kind of end up in a bit of a vacuum where you either just stick to doing what you've always done and you don't you, your business doesn't evolve in the way it could or you just start beating yourself up all the time and it's 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 not either of those is not healthy so yeah, I think that the pitfall is, I guess, not recognizing that there's another skill set, and it's okay to need help with developing it. It's not that you don't know how to lead or you can't lead. You just need a bit of a nudge sometimes because it it pokes at you personally. I think. Is there any, anyone who's had experience in the room uh, in leadership positions who would agree with with that that being a leader? Hope, yeah, you have Linus. Yeah. I, I just just to share, it was um because in Singapore you are supposed to have a mandatory military service, national service. So for me, I was uh I'm not sure anyone I'm sure I'm not sure if anyone has an, a bit of uh, military experience or some background. But just to keep the long story short, I was uh, I was I spent two years in the army, and the first my first year was just training, so technical skills. Yeah. Uh, basic combat skills, things like that. And my second year, I was promoted to a third sergeant. So I had a team under me. So I had like around seven to 10 people under me. And one of the biggest challenge I felt was that I couldn't gel well with them mm -hmm. at all. So mm -hmm. it was, I'm not sure whether, I think it was kind of a management, it was, it was a bit of a management fault, but they put me in a team that just really, didn't suit me in, 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 in a sense whereby it's a completely different background. So they have very different education background. They have very different uh, family background and it's just doesn't gel well, mm. gel well. And I think it was very challenging, especially when I got the feedback where they said that what the feedback I remember they said, they mentioned was, you know, uh, we don't really see you as our leader. You mm. have the rank, 
but mm. we don't see you as a leader. And I think that's a yes. very painful thing to hear. Like yeah. you have the position, yeah. Yeah. but they don't see you as really a leader. And I think that was one of the biggest, a big challenge, which is why I, which is why I was asking you, like, how what was the biggest yeah. pitfalls uh, for you when when you when you when you're trying to uh, work with a team or trying to develop someone? Yeah. As a, in, in one, one of the yeah. one of the things that would really help in that arena as well is identifying people by type so things like myers-briggs or insights or disc or you know there's lots out there um because when you understand somebody's personality pri- profile and you understand how they work and operate that will help you from a leadership perspective um you know especially in ways of communication ways of working etc so it might be just something just you know um just to kind of look into around management and leadership capability with different people because we are all different we're all unique um and we all go about our days in very different you know and i think lynn one of the things that um will be quite interesting is that dynamic of how leaders will lead in the whatever this new world may look like yeah absolutely and and what i was going to say building on your point already is that actually lead being a leader or being within a team it all boils down to conversations and how those conversations are held you know our life is a series of conversations isn't it some of them go well and some of them don't go so well and it's it's about that initial conversation and how well you engage someone it's about the conversation around where are we going where what's our fu- the future you know where are we heading together it's a conversation around how do I bring you into solving these problems with me? It, yeah, it's constant conversations and it's all about communication and adapting. Yeah. I think that transparency that was talked about earlier as well is, you know, sometimes it's difficult for leaders to give a full transparency of where that vision is going. But the more clarity, <laughs> you know, that that is one of the things that you know i know when i was in the corporate world is the lack of clarity the lack of focus the lack of direction and they just still wanted you to perform um <laughs> yeah, yeah lead, leading in the fog and that's what people are doing at the moment they're leading in a fog when you don't know the answers as a leader it can become very challenging and actually the best thing you can do if you imagine you've gone up a mountain and there's a path when you go up the mountain and then when you get to the top the fog descends and you can't see the path anymore what's the best thing to do it's not to separate and go off in different directions which might be tempting because you'll probably lose somebody over a cliff and somebody else will cause an avalanche it's actually to stick together and stay close and collaborate and share learning and all of those things um but it's yeah it's how you facilitate that happening i think linus is what your question is about so i think john and john had questions yeah yeah john has something to comment Oh yeah, <laughs> Linus. I'm, I'm, I have no military background, Linus, but my understanding is there's a big difference. I mean, and it certainly applies to business between management and leadership. And in management, someone can be appointed as a manager, and they're responsible for allocating resources and you know making decisions about about that kind of thing. But leadership is very different. I mean, someone said once leadership is defined by followership. You know, so leaders are the people that people follow. And I think from a military perspective, there's a well-known situation where in peacetime you get people promoted who are good at bureaucracy and admin, you know, and when the, when the balloon goes up and the war starts, then you suddenly get some people who race up through the, through the, the, the ranks, you know, because they're leaders and people are following them. Mm. Yeah. yeah, totally. <laughs> uh, other job. <laughs> yeah, no, my comment was very much on that, that business of a lot of, Managers, certainly some leaders, mistakenly think that respect comes with the title. Um, and as an employee, I was found because I always used to say managers, respect, it doesn't come with the title, sweet pea, um, and you're not even close, trust me. What is it you actually do? I think, yeah, I think one of the but things... But they were bad communicators, to be fair, or they were promoted way beyond their capabilities because, well, that's what happens. A lot. I think, I think some people go into a manager role because they've got expertise, they're the technical expert and they're due a promotion. So they get promoted to the title of manager with no managerial experience. Um, and that's and where... And they need coaches like you guys. They do. Yeah, I, I, feel, I, feel like, I feel like what happened is because um, for... Okay, I, I cannot say for certain, but the reason why certain people are promoted in... Um, in uh, at, least, at least in terms of the... Uh, Singapore's uh, national 
service uh, background is actually because uh, they, they do take things they, they, they do take things like uh, education into perspective and there's a lot of tests so uh, mm. to be fair most of the people who were promoted they usually have good grades but that doesn't necessarily translate to a very good uh, on the field commander because as a, as, a spec, as, a, as a specialist you are on the field you're on the ground and that was not something that I was extremely mm. proficient at I was a lot better at uh, you know the in, in a way in a sense the, the bureaucratic management of things but and, and the planning of things but not so much the man management of people on the ground because it's it is a very completely different skill set whereby if you're on the ground um, a lot of times the is 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 very different from let's say if you're sitting in the office so uh, that was that was I think that was one of the key challenges that I faced because this was a completely different uh, skill set and I also admit that as you know as someone new to the role I've definitely made a lot of mistakes and I think communication was something that I kind of made of it was, it was one of my biggest mistakes when I when mm. I when I first started out so I, I used to communicate with them on a on a basis whereby you know I only need you I only need when I when I when I need you to work then I'll communicate with you rather than uh, yeah. let's 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 kind of talk it out and let's let's kind of yeah. um, bond together so I think that was a very yeah. I think that's a really good, that's a really good insight, Linus, and that it's quite a common thing that happens where managers feel that if I've conveyed the information, I've communicated, I've given you information and therefore that's communication, but as you've already uh, described really well, there's, there's more to it than that, isn't there? It's an exchange, it's a, it's a building together. Yeah. yeah, I think I think what comes up as well is what we call the arc of distortion, where pretty much it's message to responder, um, receiver, sorry. And it's, it's almost like when the wi- Wi-Fi breaks, you know, you might not get the full message or you don't understand it fully and you've assumed it in the world that you mm. know. Um, and so, again, that's that clarity and um, understanding. But no, good, good point yeah. there. Andy, did you have another question? Yeah, it's, it, it's, it's, it's a bit like the the pre-battle and, and, and the battle scenario in terms of management because you've got, what, 25% of the population furloughed and the other percentage of the population are keeping the job going and, and keeping the business running and then the, they come back after having a long rest and all that kind of stuff. How, how do you see, like, the conflict there? Because uh, one's taken the fall and one's keeping it going. There's all sorts of ways of yeah. different looking at it. Yeah, I think it's a really good point, Auntie. There's going to be different needs, aren't there? Is what you're saying. And as a leader, there's a challenge, isn't there, in managing those different needs. And um, I think it is good to sort of have given some thought and some insight in advance of teams returning in terms of you know what might have been going on. So I, I, you sort of put in mind. I did. I did something this morning around something called the six needs it's a it's um a psychotherapy approach but it's sort of about how we all have a need to connect be recognized um have variety in our life have some control of our over time all that sort of thing and what you're referring to there is that people's experiences of those things will have been different depending on whether they're furloughed or continue to work or whether they have been isolated whilst in furlough some people are living on their own some people are living with families some people are living in one bedroom flats, other people are living in the middle of the countryside, you know, such a wide variety. They're going to come back feeling really different and be also anxious about how things don't feel like they used to anymore. So as I mentioned earlier, I work with a lot of dental practices. They're going to have to wear a lot of PPE and so much communication is through facial expressions and that's gone. You know, how do we cope with that? It's, it is, there's so much so many layers in the complexity of that and and actually I think that it's important for leaders to give some time to their employees to regroup I think the temptation will be right let's get back to it which is a positive message but won't give people any time to regroup and just kind of you know really readjust from where they've been to where they need to go and it's also about painting that vision of, of where we're going in the future so people sort of feel a pull forwards there's yeah it's it, I think yeah I think oh, people sorry, will no. I think people will definitely need to take a more empathetic leadership yeah. style and approach and really factor in 
um, yeah, everyone's, everyone's view um, because everyone has been living in a very different way and the psychology or the impact of that, you know, through change, the psychology of change would have been different for everyone. And actually some people are still probably still going through the change curve from the first moment they went into lockdown, whereas other people are totally embracing it and, and loving it. So, you know, I think it, I think the psychology of change um, is a very useful tool right now for leaders to adopt within their business and thinking about that when they return to work. Mm. Yeah. Thanks, okay. Sandy. Any any other questions or anyone out on Facebook that may have a question for Lynn? Um, I've still got time to start doing some fire questions. <laughs> Always sounds good. Okay, Luke. You're able to unmute. Oh, hang on. Let's see if I can there we unmute go. you. <laughs> hey. Hello. Has everybody um, come back? <laughs> I was going to say, completely different form than normal, to be fair. <laughs> I'm usually very, very sweaty like this, with a red face when I see Luke, can't I? You're not the only one, trust me. Um, Lynn, it's a bit of a, a new sort of beast that I've come across in my movement. I mean, as, as Lorraine knows, I've, I've gone from a business working with colleagues around me, um, physically being able to make contact and, um, like I say, obviously the, the social element and building the relationships that way. Um, where I am now is a smaller business, but 98% of the population of my stakeholders, if you will, um, are all remote workers. They're all mm -hmm. in customers' homes across the country and across the island as well. Um, what's the most, well, the most or maybe the top three useful things that you've found for working with remote teams as opposed to teams you can physically um, interact with? Yeah. Well, there's been some really lovely examples, I think, of teams who've adapted to working remotely. And I think there's probably some lessons in that. So one team that I've worked with, um, they've worked with each other for sort of five, ten years. So they've known each other for quite a long time, sitting in the same office for that, for that amount of time. But because of the different circumstances of, of uh, our isolation and so on, they have chosen to check in a little bit more on each other's well-being. So, for example, they did a um, uh, they, they asked everybody to have bring an item from their life, whether it's childhood or another part of their life, and talk about why it was important. And they all commented on how much insight they got into one another, and a little bit about knowing each other on another level that they had never known before. I mean, these are people that have worked together for so long, hmm. and. It, it kind of created more personal connection and I think that's the challenge isn't it on especially with a group of people online I think one-to-one -one maybe online that's mm. more achievable but I think what we tend to do with teams is dive straight into what's the to-do list so have you done this where have you got to on that you know and maybe it's slicing your time up a little bit so some of the time is doing and some of the time is being and facilitating from being time together it's a bit of a weird label but mm. it's that kind of human connection piece and and focusing on that as an objective actually as a thing that happens without making it you know a hard work to do list mm. item I, th I think that's i think that's one of the most important things is is not just yeah not just focusing on the output all the time i suppose it's not just work is it i suppose that's kind of the um the sort of yeah. mantra from it because I mean obviously when, when they come into the office I can obviously have that interaction with them the same as, as yeah. office staff and you know even as high as CEO um, but it's the fact that they're on the road 90% of the time that it makes it difficult to do that mm. um, so no using things like that and that kind of you know they're not quite as au fait as us with the video communications I think we're still all telephones and I think you've just got the hang of Skype yeah. um, but the idea of right you know picking up and and taking something from their personal life to to allow them to build that relationship up as well as well as me learning more about them really yeah absolutely so yeah and i think the other thing that's just sort of come to mind as well is how you solve problems together mm. as well and it, you know it'd probably be that you'd have to build this skill set if it's something that they're not used to doing but um people will tend to sort of i guess come with a problem and, and ask their leader to, to solve it you know solve it for me but actually within a team you can build um that uh, capability by helping them to ask each other questions and coach each other effectively 
But have you come across a action learning? Not by definition, but yeah. I think I kind of know what. I know what it is, yeah. So action yeah. learning is just some rules around you bring your problem and, it, and people have to ask you questions. They can't give you advice. They just ask you questions until you get to your solution. And it's kind of a discipline around, you know, we just want to get to solving it straight away rather than helping someone work it out. By helping someone to work it out, they're building capability. And by getting others to practice asking questions, you're building that capability as well. So it's things like that. It's a brilliant, brilliant tool. It's, it's an interesting one watching people learn how to do it, though, because people, especially if they are a fixer, <laughs> yeah, they just want to give... Yeah, yeah. But it's definitely worth um, trialling it, um, especially from a leadership capacity as well. That's something that I would encourage all leaders to do, to, to build the strength within the team and, and to give some empowerment. Mm-hmm. And that's funny enough, kind of what I'm trying to do, because you, you're looking at the fixer here. Um, because of the role, <laughs> yeah. it's kind of, I'm so used to being that person that they say, right, you know, come on, Luke, this is what we've got to deal with. How can we solve it from, yeah. you know, a manager or a leader down? Yeah. Now that I'm in a position where, you know, I am the HR department, I am the kind of leader of my own troops, if you will. Yeah. It's trying to find the best way to get the managers to learn their elements. Of it. And I mean, I, I try and do it when they're on site by saying, right, you know, you've got a case, you've done the investigation on it, let's sit down, you talk to me do what you're going to do and what the conclusion is going to be and I'll just pass and curveball that you um, yeah. and try and coach it that way but it's, it's harder when you're talking to someone who's somewhere in the Midlands um, yeah. saying right I've got this and I've, I've done this and done that and you're like well hold on a minute you know you, you know you need to kind of talk me through it rather than saying I've done <laughs> you know yeah 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 so it's just gonna um, challenge a different skill set you, it sounds like you already have it but it's just starting to practice that in a different way isn't mm. it and and pulling yourself back from the brink of advice all the time by the sound of it i just wrote a blog actually on the drama triangle i don't know whether you've oh, seen right. that but um we tend to take up a position of rescuer victim or persecutor which are quite negative labels mm. but by rescuing someone all the time which is what you're talking about when you give an advice actually you, dis- you risk disempowering them mm. or they, you know, they will see you as a persecutor and you know, start blaming and things like that. So it's how you shift people out of those positions and how you shift yourself out of those positions too. And lots of team leaders inadvertently become rescuers because they want to be helpful. Mm. It comes from the very best of intentions. You want to be helpful, um, but it's how you switch that. So that might be helpful. I'll send it. Yeah. And that also encourages motivation as well, because people, if they feel empowered, they feel motivated and, you know, they're not having to run to you for the next fix. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. which, is what, which is what I'm trying to avoid, because, like, obviously, Lorraine, you'll know it from our Debenhams days, but it's the idea of always, you know, we were always empowered there to, to go to try and sort to a degree and then only come to our managers, if you will, um, when there was a, a hurdle we needed to overcome. Um, where I've walked into now, the predecessor was very much the fixer, and they've had a fixer come into a mm, fixer role. Yes. They yeah. kind of see it as well. It's a like for like. There's no problem. Yeah. But I'm looking there, saying, right, I don't need to be involved in every little thing because obviously yeah. single man HR. There's a lot to do. Um, so it's kind of right. I want to empower the managers to do their bits as well, and obviously not shy away from it. But yeah. to be able to support rather than rescue is, as you rightly say. So yeah. no, thank thank you for that. It's given yeah. me a few so bits you can go for it's, it's a culture change, isn't it, that you're starting to facilitate and it takes time. So yeah, definitely. So, thank you. You are some really, really, really great questions. Anyone else got any questions or anyone on Facebook that's currently watching any questions that you have for Lynn around uh, coaching, uh, leadership development, um, or anything like that. Lynn, uh, just a quick question around um, finding the right coach. Um, I've been asked a couple of times this week just from, from different people about the world is saturated with coaches. <laughs> Tell me about um, it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, how, how would you advise that response? So it's an actual question someone asked me yeah. today. Um, I, think, I thought I'd I ask think, you. Yeah, I think I can only speak for my own experience really and I think recommendations are always a good thing isn't it but, but actually I've sort of um I read blogs I watch videos I get in things like these zoom calls and I just watch and listen 
um, in terms of the sort of information that people are sharing and the level of that information that they're sharing and whether it resonates with me. And when I start thinking, oh, I'm really interested in talking to them a little bit more because they've maybe got a perspective that I haven't considered. I think they'll be able to help me think differently than, you know, I'll, I'll consider them as a coach. Or you might have a specific need. So, you know, there's coaches out there that will, I, I don't know whether to call them coaches, but mentors probably is best, best of word really, but people who will help you with your sales or your marketing or, you know, whatever it is. And then it's a specific need. And it's the same process really for choosing those people. I want to know, they have to feel credible to me. And actually what feels credible to me might be different to what feels credible to other people. It's a very personal decision actually. And I think you just need to, watch read and have conversations and then see if a relationship feels like it could build yeah it's a bit yeah she watch the answer i feel but i think it's a relationship so it's got to be evolved key is the the rapport between coach and coachee or client whoever you want to call them is is key and actually that point around um getting you to think differently that's that is the key you know because mm -hmm. if they're just going to tell you stuff you already know then it's a wasted investment of not just time but money as well so okay any other questions from you guys in the room I'm having a look on Facebook. Facebook is quiet as far as questions. There's people watching, um, but they're not coming forward with any questions. Maybe we've answered all their questions that they had before. One other question that actually came through, um, so I've, I'm asking people to ask questions before the show as well now, um, was what's the best way to become a coach? Now, I can obviously give my approach to that, but mm. what's your view? Yeah. Again, I think that everybody's journey is quite different, isn't it? And for me personally, I think that as a coach, you have to have an interest and a passion for personal development. Um, if you think of, to me, the ultimate coach is a therapist or a psychotherapist or a counsellor. So, you know, they sort of, they go deeper, if you like, the therapist and counsellor go deeper. And to become a therapist or a counsellor, you have to do a lot of personal work. You have to let go of your own shit and your own baggage because otherwise you bring it into the room with you and you project stuff onto your clients. And I think it's similar with coaches, actually. You have to be able to see clearly and not contaminate your conversations with your previous view of the world, you know. So, for example, um, I have told you already I had a separation in my past and someone might think oh i'd like to be coached by lynn because i've also had a separation so she's going to know what that experience is like if i'd still got my baggage about that then i might inadvertently guide them in a certain way <laughs> so i need to have you know let go of as much of that rubbish as i can and i'm not i don't think anybody can ever say they'll call it completely clear of baggage but there's got to be a motivation to do some of that work and let me tell you I am by no means perfect and my family will tell you that as well but it's about <laughs> self-awareness I think is so important as a, as a coach and it's the journey that you go on to evolve that self-awareness and it's a continuous journey forever in my opinion yeah yeah no that's a really good good response yeah. okay so we've got about five minutes left um I've kind of finished with my questions. Uh, it looks like the room has finished, unless you've got any last questions you suddenly want to fire at Lynn. Um, Lynn, you've given us a load of information. You've answered the questions really, really well. So thank you very much for that. Is there any other like top tips or anything that you could share for this either moment that we are in right now or going mm -hmm. forward into our future world? Um, something, you know, might be some insights that you've seen. Um, yeah. I think it's probably quite a personal sort of message really but again you know you, you coach and you work from your place of authenticity and for me it's been my life has been a journey of taking off the mask as we said Lorraine you're know, removing that mask learning who I was being okay with being a salesperson who wanted tranquility um so sort of you know marrying those two off and it's about finding ways in life whether it's in business or as an individual 
find that authenticity and to be bold with it. And, you know, I'm still working on that journey of, you know, John's a great example. He just doesn't care. <laughs> He's just John Harvey I'm talking about. He's just <laughs> But that's a lovely, I, I really admire that quality. And I think most of us do. We just want to be given permission to be bold and authentic and ourselves. And I guess that's the journey that I want to help people, individuals and businesses to achieve. And because it's felt like a part of my journey too. Have you got anything to say about that, John a whole Harvey? Lot of trouble. Get into a whole lot of trouble. Uh. <laughs> I think the uh. other John would agree. It comes from an age point of view as well. You get yeah, to the point where you you don't care because you don't yeah. have to. That's awful. Yeah. Didn't make yeah, sound by that, but no, we spend a lot of time worrying about whether people like us, whether we're pleasing them, that sort of thing. And I still do. I haven't let go of that. But you know, it's a journey towards. Yeah, letting that go, I think. Oh, I spend a lot of time worrying about do people like me, trust me. Yeah. <laughs> That's good to you, know. get older, you either go well, one or two ways, you either go more mellow or you get more crotchety. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think when you do let go a little bit, though, and you're just happy in your own skin, you accept who you are, you accept that the people around you are the right people and you've got the right people that are encouraging, supporting, motivating and all that kind of stuff, then life kind of does feel better it's yes. that lesson that we learn through life and it's difficult to let go of some of those people that we may love dearly but actually they are just not healthy um so yeah it's <laughs> it's a huge lesson there i think um maybe maybe john we'll do another session with you on um life living as john <laughs> oh no 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 <laughs> Oh, thank you. Thank you ever so much, Lynn. It's been really insightful. Yeah, and um, I'm just going to say goodbye to everybody on Facebook okay. uh, and we'll stop the Facebook stream. So thank you for joining us. Um, just to quickly really. just tell you next week we have Paul McGee. The week after we have Andy Gilbert. I will be posting these out um, if you want to come and join. Um, both of those people are um, they've, they're authors, they're motivational speakers. They work internationally. So if you are interested, then keep a look out and uh, book on. So goodbye for you guys on Facebook. Cool. <laughs> okay, I'm going to stop the recording as well. Like a bird on a tree I'm just sitting here I got time